Me and my bay. 15 questions asked and answered. So this message started tonight with the premise, well, I was sitting there, to be honest, I'd written a whole lot of stuff, and I thought, yeah, this is pretty boring. What would I say if I was being really honest? Okay? So tonight, I've come up with some questions that hopefully you're asking, and that I can give you an honest answer. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but I'm going to give it to you how I see it. So mixed into this message, I'm sure there will be the foundation of truth from the Word of God, yes, that lights our feet and guides our path. There will also be mixed in some silly jokes and some stories about John where admittedly he may or may not go under the bus. And there will also be a degree of opinion from myself. As the mother of this house, I feel like it is only fitting that I give you what I think. (laughs) All right, number one. If the MC says, tell your neighbor that the person is good looking, Should I actually say that? I don't know if you said that tonight, Barnsey, but you know, you come to a rise church and people say, tell your neighbor they're good looking. Well, as far as pick up lines go, I would say it's pretty good. It's certainly better than some that I've heard. Hey girl, I'd say God bless you, but he clearly already has. You and me, We're like loaves and fishes. We just might be a miracle together. (laughs) How about this for a dating activity? Want to come over and watch Left Behind? This is for the adults. So, I was reading the book of Numbers the other day and I realized I don't have yours. Hey girl, how would you like to join my purpose-driven life? I'm not usually very prophetic, but I can see us together. What's your name and number so I can add you to my prayer list? And this is my personal favorite. Wanna practice speaking in tongues together? This is what you came out for. (laughs) Okay, number two. (laughs) Hopefully there is a disclaimer that I shouldn't embarrass my children. Number two, when? When should I date? When should I date? Well, here what I want to say is your age and your stage is what matters. Uh, If you're a teenager, I would strongly suggest that you ask your parents what age they say you can date because, you know, there is a range of opinions even among Christian parents about what age, and I would say it's probably linked to your personal maturity. You know how you can have two kids in a family, one of them tidies their room, one of them their room is a pigsty. That might reflect on whether you're ready to date. Just saying, teenage boys, tidy your room, Okay. (laughs) Tidy your room before mum and dad say you're ready to date. I would suggest tonight, and this is my opinion, I would suggest tonight that 17 is a great age before you shouldn't really get too involved before 17. Why is that? Well, because the purpose of dating is to see whether you're a good fit for marriage. And there's no way, let's be honest, you're getting married at 14. (laughs) That would not be allowed in our nation. So... Really, there's not a lot of point singling someone out too soon. You see, the purpose of dating is to determine whether you're a good fit to be married. Dating is supposed to have some kind of meaning. It's not just, I want to go round with you, like they said at school. You know, the truth is... (laughs) If you date for too long, you will get closer and closer, but you'll still be too young to marry. And at that point, you'll probably be more tempted to compromise your beliefs because you've formed such a bond that you want to go further than you can at your age and stage. What about your stage? Well, if you're at school, then really your priority should be to do well at school. Your priority should be your studies. You need to be learning that math. You need to be learning those physics. You need to be learning that good English. You need to focus, all right? Do your homework, for goodness sake. Stop stalking that girl on Instagram and just do your homework. 
You're not going to be able to pay to take her on a date if you can't figure out how much you're spending. <laughs> Do your addition. <laughs> Let's be honest. At school, you need to focus. And to be honest, in my experience, really, you don't have a lot of money when you're at school, and clearly dating is going to put you out of pocket quite a bit, especially if you want to go somewhere nice. I had to teach John about where to take me. His first date, shall I tell you where he took me? Our first date, I still remember I was wearing my little pink cardigan that I got from Just Jeans, and uh, I had my straight leg wide jeans that were really cool back then, and he took me to Georgie Pie. <laughs> Georgie Pie, because you could get $1 pies and a $2 hot chocolate. And you could sit there as long as you wanted and nobody would bother you, except the cleaning people. But the reason the cleaning people bothered us is because I spilt the hot chocolate all over myself. The first thing John experienced when he went on the date is that my hand-eye coordination is not brilliant. But he was willing to live with that, clearly. And as I managed to refine his tastes, we end up going to more and more fancy restaurants but unfortunately, when we went to the fancy restaurant after having our Georgie Pie date, we both sat there like fish out of water because we were putting on our best manners with napkins and glasses and sitting there like this and conversation didn't flow. We did better at Georgie Pie. <laughs> the other thing you know when you should date is your emotional readiness. Your emotional readiness matters. There's a certain level of maturity that it takes to actually date someone, to care enough for another person's feelings, that you're not in there to get what you can get, but you're aware that this person is precious, this person is a child of God, and that you have a responsibility to treat them in a certain manner. You need a certain level of maturity to be able to work through issues, to be able to discuss your values. You know, uh, as you'd know when you're raising your children or you've seen kids, maybe you helped serve in Rocket today and you saw those kids, some of them weren't getting their own way. What did they do? They threw their toys. They threw their toys or they threw a tantrum. You know, I won't name which child of mine used to have full-blown tantrums. But we need to ask ourselves if we've reached a place where we have self-control over our emotions, you know, whether we're actually going to be in this relationship and be serious or be throwing our toys when things don't go our way. Number three, how do I know when to commit to dating? Well, I strongly suggest that as Christians, whilst we should be realizing that dating is a path to marriage, we can overthink the first few dates. We can think about it a bit too seriously. You know, it's like you should have a preliminary set of dates just to get to know the person. You know, you can't fall in love with someone who you think they are. You have to fall in love with a real person. You can't fall in love with a persona. And actually, dating is a journey to really get to know who that person is, not the image of who we think they are. You know, love has rose-tinted glasses. It's true. We always think, oh, my goodness, we put people on a pedestal. They're like the ideal person. They don't fart. They don't pick their nose. They are perfect. And then they, you get married. And this person is just amazing. But, you know, we actually date to get to know each other. So, you know, in church and in any environment, people should be able to go out for a coffee or out for a movie before the rest of you lot are marrying them off. I mean, just cool it, folks. Just, just take it down a notch. Just because someone went out for coffee doesn't mean there's put, they're putting a ring on it, okay? So just cool it down a notch. You know, I actually have discovered that sometimes the very friends who are forcing you, saying, you should marry them, you went on a date, often they might end up taking the same person out on the date. So, you know, it happens. It happens. You've got to cool it down a little bit. You know, if you've been interested to go out for a coffee and you liked it, go out again. Dating is saying there's an attraction to you more than to other people. I'm interested in you, and it's a saying, I'm committed to finding out more about you. It's a commitment not to kiss them, not to hold their hand. It's a commitment to get to know the person. You know, if you enjoy conversation, and if you could enjoy kissing them, then you should date them, okay? Those are good signs to take the next step. You know, uh, John and I didn't really have the conversation first. He jumped straight to taking hold of my hand. I know, can you believe it? 
We were out in this environment and suddenly my hand was being held. I was like, he's holding my hand. But I can tell you that it was fairly electric hand holding. And so when he said to me, would you like to go out driving home in the car? I said, yes. I said, yes, because I'd been convinced from holding his hand. No, just kidding. <laughs> just joking. Anyway, is number four, is there a Mr. or Mrs. Right? Is there a right one for me? Well, this is a tricky one, isn't it? Has anyone been asking this? Is there just one person for me? Has God, I mean, God's written out his plan from all eternity. Surely he knows who I should be with and he's got our books side by side in heaven's library. We're all lined up, our spines are matching. Can you see it? Okay, that's weird. All right. I would say that there is definitely a Mr. or Mrs. Wrong. There is definitely a Mr. or Mrs. Wrong. You know, God has given us all free will and choice. And with our choice, I would encourage every person in this room, whatever you do, choose wisely. Choose wisely. You know, once you choose as a Christian, you can't change your mind. I'm sorry, there's no money back guarantee on marriage. So I'm sorry, but you can't take it back. It's a commitment. It's a tied commitment. It's a covenant. So choose wisely. God has given you the choice. God has given you the ability to choose. And that's where our parents, our friends, our pastors, uh, the Bible come into play. And there's some things that we can ask ourselves about, is this person the right one? I would suggest, do you feel like a better person when you're with them? You know how when you're with some people and you find yourself kind of gossiping and you don't want to gossip? Or when you're with some people and they're being a bit snarky and you sort of don't feel so good. Or when you're with, in an environment and people want to watch this thing and you don't want to watch it, you start to know how you feel around certain people. So it should be with your intended. You have to listen to that sense of conviction on the inside if a person is taking you in a direction that is not a holy or a godly or righteous direction and you need to get out of that pretty quick smart. You know, do you feel like a better person when you're with them? And do they bring out the best in you? And also, do you bring out the best in them? You know, John and I love that old movie. It's old now. As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson and the little puppy dog. And uh, he's got OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, and he can't walk on a crack. And he gets really distressed and really upset in um, uh, social situations. He can't relate to people. But this one woman co comes along and she starts to be part of his life. And his compliment to her, she's like, pay me a compliment, pay me a compliment. And his one compliment to her is, you make me want to be a better man. And I think that's ultimately how you know that they are Mr. or Mrs. Right. You know, hopefully if you're at the right age and stage to date, you have a sense of what God has called you to do with your life. I would ask, is what God has called me to do going to be limited or fulfilled with this person. You see, if you're at the, age, at the age of 17, I myself, I knew, I surrendered my life and I knew what God had for me. So I knew that John was the, God's blessing in my life. <laughs> but the reality is that by this age and stage, we should have an idea of what God's purpose is. And if those purposes align, then that leads us to build a life together. But if those purposes are completely differently, like they want to be a missionary in India, India and you want to be a missionary on the other side of the world, I don't know geography, is that America? Help me out, Ben. <laughs> India, America, well clearly, not meant to be together, okay? All right, you know, ask about God what he thinks as well. You know, uh, I had a first boyfriend, well, this is awkward, isn't it? Mum's here talking about what happened before dad, okay? It's a little bit awkward, but it's important for you to know this. I actually did have a boyfriend before John. Uh, John has an affectionate name for him, but I won't say it here. Okay. You never know who watches these things. Now, he was a great guy. Of course he was. He was a lovely guy. Do you think I would have dated a dropkick? I mean, do you think I would have dated someone who was dumb? No. He was lovely, but was he the one for me? Well, I thought so for quite a while. 
And then it got to the stage, after I'd been dating him for a year, my mum started to pray. Praise God for godly mums who pray. And she started to pray and said, okay, God, if this is not the right one for Gillian, then let it be revealed to Gillian. And so she just, I don't know why, but she felt to pray that week for that. And basically, I, it was like night and day. From the start of the week, I was in love. By the end of the week, I knew it was time to say goodbye. And it was cold and it was hard, but it was absolutely the right thing because his life and my life were going to be India and America. We were going in different directions. And you know, isn't that important? Because who you choose determines the future you choose. Who you choose determines the future you choose. I mean, think about it for a second. If you marry a photographer, if you marry a landscape photographer, no doubt they will have you donning on a pack backpack and doing intrepid journeys all around the world to take that photo. What about a singer? You'll be turning up to their concerts, you'll be going to their performances, you'll be watching them perform in a band. What about a lawyer? What about a teacher? What about a builder? Well, you might always live in a home project, right? Or you might have the best furniture, it's homemade and it's all perfect. You never quite know, do you? Builders, you know, getting on. An architect. But what future do you see that God has for you? Because the person that you're choosing is going to be a big part of your future. Number five, I need to keep moving because I've got 15 questions to ask and answer tonight. Number five, I'm afraid, Gillian, I won't find my bay. I won't find him. <laughs> well, okay. Stick to get, get it together, everybody. Get it together. Get some grit. Get some grit. Be happy while you're single. Enjoy it. I call it having a boyfriend holiday. <laughs> Enjoy it. A husband holiday. John hasn't traveled much this year, so I'm quite pleased he's away tonight in Whangarei. I've got a husband holiday for one night. It's a good thing. I can watch the Netflix I want to watch <laughs> that he doesn't like. It's great. Sorry, that was silly. But perfect love, perfect love drives out fear. Do you know tonight that God actually loves you perfectly? And that's why we don't need to fear. We have to just trust. And I know it sounds saccharine, but it is truth. We have to trust in God's purpose and timing for our lives. It is testing sometimes as we've become older or been around for a while and we still feel like we're waiting. It is testing, but faith is trust. Faith is trust. And that's basically the bottom line. We have to trust. And we can also do one other thing. We can pray. The Bible says to ask the Lord for what we want. And we can ask him for the right person at the right time. And we can seek him for his will for us. I would encourage us to ask the Lord for what we're seeking and, and pray. But let's avoid feeling desperate by being dependent on God. Number six, I've been in relationships and I've been hurt. What should I do? You know, I, I, can, I can understand this because one of the first things that happens when you've been in a relationship and it didn't work out is you're like, did I just waste my time? You know, I spent a year dating this person or I, I spent this amount of time with this person. Like, was that just a waste? Firstly, no. In life, we, we learn from everything. And every person can teach us things. We can learn from every person because every person is made in the image of God. So that person will have taught you things, even if we're not aware of it right now. Sometimes we can feel like we're a failure, that it didn't work out. Sometimes we work so hard to make a relationship work when actually it is actually should just be cut off. If we have to work too hard to make it work, that's probably a clue that we shouldn't stay involved in that relationship. We can feel like we won't be loved again. And sometimes we can feel like, man, I'm suddenly alone. I was out dating them all the time. Now I don't know what to do with my time. Like, what do I do now that I'm not with them? You know, all of those things hurt. And we feel like this because it was real love. Just because you broke up or got hurt, it doesn't mean that it wasn't real. It was real love. And that's why it's painful. We only get hurt when we truly love somebody. So I would say this. Forgive the ones who've hurt you. Forgive. It's all we can do. We have to forgive the people that hurt us. We have to think through situations or moments or times where we were let down or times when things happened that we weren't happy about, and we have to forgive them. And then we also have to forgive ourselves. You know, we're obviously in a two-way street in any relationship. 
And there will be things that we did that weren't great either, but we have to forgive ourselves as well to move forward. I would say look forward. Learn from the past, but don't be limited by the past. Learn, but don't be limited. You know, Paul says, I push on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me, a scripture that I've preached on before. But I love the scripture because he was killing people. He was a murderer. He was living his worst life. And he's like, I'm going to forget about who I was and the mistakes I've made, and I'm going to live in the future Christ has for me. And that's what we have to do when we've been hurt in a relationship. Live in the future Christ has for me. I would say that for one week, you could treat yourself to ice cream and Netflix. Give yourself some time to be angry. Give yourself some time to see the good and forgive. But then pick yourself up. Pick yourself up. Turn off the Netflix and go out and live your life. You know, if you still find after a few months of your own journey, working it out, if you still find after a few months there's an issue, then I would say seek prayer support. Talk to a trusted friend and get them to pray with you and work through any hurts or issues or things that have, have come in and created some tenderness in your heart. Work through the loss. I would also say that if the hurt has resulted from abuse of any kind, that you should seek counseling and have prayer ministry. Because Above all, we need to learn to know our own value and not place ourselves in a relationship where, would, where we would again maybe be subjected to abuse. We are more valuable than that in Jesus' name. Number seven, how do I move on? Bay broke my heart and I'm still in love. Well, love yourself enough to let go. Love that is not returned is soul destroying. Let go. Grieve. Grieve, it is a loss. Mourn over the loss of someone who was precious to you. You can't have them in your life the way it used to be, so let go. Release them from any words or promises that they set to you. Don't second guess the time you were with them. Treasure the good moments, but let them go. Dream again. You know, when we feel like this, that I still love them, I'm still in love, when we feel like this, it's like our whole future is still bound in a dream of them. It's like the future we still see is a future with them. But God's already saying it's time to let go. We have to dream again. Let go of the old dream. Let go of the old vision and dream again. Let you see a future that God has for you, a future with new friends and new relationships and new horizons. Begin to dream again. Don't live in the loss. Live in a future dream that God wants to bless your life with. You know, pray as well that God would fill the gap because there is a gap, isn't there? When someone dear to us is no longer there and we can't just ring them on the phone or text them or Instagram story them or whatever you do these days, right? Facebook them. I mean, we used to just talk face to face, you know? We used to just go to Georgie Pie. The, pray that God would fill the gap. Fill the gap that's missing in your life. And know this, that whilst that person moved on, God is at work in this. Because what you might not see right now is that God has got someone better for you. If they broke it off and you couldn't see it, trust God that God has someone better for you, the right one for you. If they broke it off, they clearly weren't going to value you and treat you in a way that you would deserve for a lifelong commitment. Number eight, I'm feeling pressured to date by my mates. What do I do? Well, poor Nate experienced this at Passionate Conference. In the pre-service show, dear old Nate, poor Nate, we had a chant. It's been quite a current theme all year. Get Nate a date. Get Nate a date. So Nate, where are you tonight? Okay, I've got some words of encouragement for you. Nate, tonight, just always remember, your mates are not the ones making a lifelong potential decision. You are. And at the end of the day, your mate won't wake up in bed next to that person. You will. You will wake up next to them. So don't do what others tell you. And Nate, I've got a song for you tonight. Rock set. Listen to your heart. Okay? You can check it out later on Vivo. Oh my gosh, it'll be so good. Rock set. I was like Googling rock set and I was like, oh my goodness. She was so good back in the 90s or 80s. I don't know which it was, but it was my childhood was rock set. Okay, number nine. I'm with a nice bay, but I have doubts. 
Do I keep dating? How do I know when Bay needs to go away? <laughs> well, I would say tonight, doubts are there to highlight issues. If there are things that you can't live with now, then don't commit to live with them till death do you part. If the person doesn't have integrity in their personal life right now, then listen to those doubts. Listen to those doubts. If there are any alarm bells, then pay them some attention. Where there is smoke, there really might be a fire. Isn't that true? Listen to your doubts. They're there to highlight those issues. Say, maybe it's time to say goodbye. You know, I want to say, though, that there is a journey, though, where all relationships get to a point where you discover this person is not entirely perfect. So at some point, you've got to decide what level of perfect are you willing to live with? You know, are they perfect enough for you? Can you live with their faults and failings and foibles? Can you live with whiskers in the sink? Can you live with people that don't pick up their dirty laundry? Just kidding, not kidding. Okay. <laughs> What was I saying? Number 10, okay, we're gonna get right to it, and I've definitely taken that one extra five minutes because I'm only up to question number 10, and this is where it gets a bit juicy. Bay and I are in a sexual relationship and not married. What could I do? All right, we're gonna break it down tonight. The Bible is very clear. Sex is for marriage. Do you wanna follow Jesus, or do you wanna follow desire? Jesus or your desires? Who are you following right now? Is eternity more important than momentary gratification? It's a choice. You choose. You choose. Moment, eternity. Hello, a little bit of context. One moment. You know, why do people always want to have sex? Because it doesn't last forever. It's a moment. But eternity lasts forever. I know what I would choose in the scales of importance. Momentary, eternity. It always is eternity. You know, if you want to choose to follow Jesus, then to just tonight decide to obey Jesus. And as I, I mentioned this morning, but even the devil knows Jesus, but the devil didn't obey Jesus. We all know what's happening to him. We all know what's happening to him. I won't go into what's happening in the world of rugby, but there are a lot of thoughts. There are a lot of thoughts. There needs to be some tolerance for Christians, right? People preaching a gospel of tolerance. Something's wrong with that equation. Anyway, what do you need to do? You need to marry Bay. If you're at the age and stage and emotional maturity to get married, well, rather than burn with desire, as the Bible says, get married. Oh my goodness, it doesn't have to be flash and fancy. We don't need all the money in the world. You can get married, you can have a wedding celebration publicly later, but just go and fulfill the covenant under the sight of God. Get married legally and under the sight of God. Don't burn with desire. Marry your bae. If you're not ready to marry them, then abstain. Stop having, that means stop having sex or sexual intimacy. Okay? abstain. Find a way to make it happen. I'm going to give us some tips if I've got time. Or break it off. Just break it off. If it's a habit in your relationship, then please rethink the patterns of behavior that you have that lead you to this place. Rethink those patterns, i.e. sitting in a parked car late at night till the windows steam up. Going to your house when you know the parents are out. Change your patterns of behavior. If your bay is wanting more, wanting what you are no longer willing to give, break it off or wait until marriage is an option. You know, I know that Christians sometimes want to know this. How far is too far? Well, I would say we have spoken on this before. It's on YouTube, top 10 tips on dating. But I would just say tonight briefly that if clothing covers it, how about making it a no-go zone, yeah? It's not a hard one. Number 11, what do I do when I struggle with lust? I feel like it drives me. Okay, well firstly, this can be something that we need deliverance from. It entered through the eye gate. 
We need deliverance from some things that the devil comes and accosts our lives with. There can be familiar spirits and spirits that come into our lives, and actually it can be a force, a spiritual force at work in us, compelling us. So first, step one, pray for deliverance. Pray for deliverance from a spirit of lust, and then go to do the rest of the work. Avoid the triggers that make you hungry. Lust is primarily an appetite. And we can shrink our stomach for it or increase our appetite for it by what we consume and what we feed on. Maybe we're feeding on TV shows that show too much. We've got to discover what it is that we're feeding on. You know, uh, maybe you're like me. I decide weekly that I don't want to eat chocolate, yet somehow it ends up in my cupboard and then I end up eating some. (laughs) What do we really want? What do we really want? We will go after what we really want. So if I really don't want to eat chocolate, I won't keep chocolate nearby in case I want some. I would say put parental controls on your own device. You might be an adult. You might be a young adult. Doesn't hurt you to have parental restrictions. Might mean you're saved from some gore and horror and gratuitous violence along with a bit of uncovering that might take place. Put a parental control on your device. As John always says, Go to bed early. I'm not sure if that's his advice because he's an early morning person, but I think it works. Go to bed early. Live in the light, not in the night. Live a real life. Don't live a virtual life. Look, I'd encourage you that one of the things that we need is real relationships because lust is an appetite, but appetites do need to be satisfied. And real searching, and you know, sexual searching is usually a sign that we're not having fulfillment in real relationships. When we laugh, when we cry, when we spend time with one another, when we eat together, when we just take the time to actually be with one another, we are feeding our soul. We're satisfying a deep human need for interaction, for companionship, for dopamine hits of connecting with people emotionally. If we've connected with people emotionally, our needs sexually will be far more reduced. It's how God's designed it. That's why we live in community so that we would have fulfillment and satisfaction in relationships that are filial, friendship relationships. Okay, and lastly on that one, find a different passion and focus. If you have a lust that drives you, find something else to drive you. Get a passion in your life. Get a focus in your life. Get a purpose that compels you to live right and not muck around. You know, when you actually have a goal, have something to live for that's worth living for, then you're not going to muck around with all the stuff that's going to hold you back. You'll actually live in a way that matters. I want to encourage us all that as we grow closer to God, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives will grow, and it is self-control. So as we see, self-control is not something God just gives us. It's something that grows. So I would encourage you, don't beat yourself up if this is a journey of struggling, but keep a contrite heart. Tr- trust in the Lord. Pray. Change your appetite. Work to do what you can do. But know that as we pursue God, self-control will start to grow. You know, it's amazing, isn't it, when you go on a journey, how as time goes on, things that used to be what drove you no longer drive you because you changed your focus. And that's what happens over time. You know, Set boundaries and stick to them. If you struggle with lust, set boundaries and stick to them. Okay, so two ways that I had set boundaries in my life. I had a talk with mom. I had a talk with mom when I was a teenager, and we set some boundaries. What do you think is appropriate to do when you're dating? What do you think is appropriate? What do you need to do? Bef- what, do you, what needs to wait till marriage? We had a mother-daughter chat, but in that chat, there were boundaries that were set that were stuck to for the rest of my life. Because you know what, I'd actually thought about it. So when the moment comes, it's not like you're at a disadvantage, but you're prepared. Men, women, teenagers, be prepared because it's not like lust is not gonna hit you in a moment. If you're human and alive, passion and desire will stir at some point. But if you've already decided what's appropriate, you'll be far more likely to know how to behave rather than letting emotions push you to act. I also had a discussion with John when we were dating, we discussed what our boundaries were gonna be. Because hey, if you're attracted to someone and you're dating them, you definitely better set some boundaries. We already had the electric hand holding, but we made a commitment, or we set a commitment not to, I think pash is kind of an ugly word, but we set a commitment not to French kiss, shall we say that, until we were engaged. Um, I think we stuck to it. It's kind of 22 years ago, so it gets a little blurry. 
maybe it was five and a half months, or maybe we got to six, I can't quite remember. However, what I do know is John wasn't mucking around, he got engaged after six months. So, you can ask yourself what that was about. <laughs> Number 12, the world says try before you buy. Why wouldn't I do that? I mean, every magazine, Cosmo, Mind Food, whatever, Men's Health, it's all saying try before you buy. How do you know if you're sexually compatible? It would be terrible, wouldn't it? You end up married and just not good together in bed. That would be disastrous. Well, do Christians worry about that? No, for goodness sake, no. It's not about compatibility. Can I just say this, and I've got to be clear tonight. What a stupid thing to worry about. What a stupid, I have never heard of a more stupid concept. Are we compatible? Okay, so firstly, sex is more than mechanics. Married couples learn how to make love to each other, and compatibility has not got much to do with it. All you need is attraction. You know, because sex is an important and valuable gift in a marriage, I would encourage you, don't get married without attraction. Don't get married without attraction, because that's very important, that you would actually desire to be intimate with your spouse. You know, I would say to you tonight that very much, uh, sorry, the majority of people have very little trouble enjoying unwrapping their present after waiting patiently to receive it. The unwrapping is quite fun. Don't you worry. <laughs> but the key thing you must have is attraction. And trust me, you will know if you have that. Compatibility in bed, well, you'll find that out on the journey. You'll, you'll make it work. But is there attraction? There must be. There must be. I'll never forget the moment. I've told you before, but I'll never forget the moment I knew that John was attractive. He was, I was sitting, number seven, Glen Armand Road, Mount Eden. It was the evening sun was setting. I was sitting on the volcanic rock wall in the warm sun. And suddenly, over the brow of the hill came a white van. It was like a white steed. And a redhead man driving the van. And I was like, oh, He's driving a van. <laughs> wow. That's my kind of man. I haven't been driven in a van before. My family had a station wagon. <laughs> so I got in the van and I looked at John, <laughs> setting sun. I thought, he's a manly man. He drives a van. <laughs> And that was when I knew how hot he was. Number 13. Number 13. I'm going to get there. Don't worry. Are desires and passion bad? Jillian, I'm hearing this talk about lust. I'm hearing this talk about compatibility. It does this mean that, you know, desire is bad, passion is bad. Well, I called my conference passionate, so clearly not. Okay. No, they are good. Lust is bad. What is lust when passion and desire lose their boundaries? When passion and desire lose boundaries, it's when it becomes lust. But we must have desire and passion in a committed relationship. And I would say this, not for a moment, but for a lifetime. For a lifetime. Because why? Because you're more important than a moment. You are so much more important than a moment. We need to have passion. We deserve passion our whole life. You deserve passion your whole life. To be passionately loved. To love passionately. You deserve that your whole life not just in a moment. So I would say strongly, don't let a moment define your destiny. Emotions will reveal the heart and compel us, but they must not control us. We will have emotions, we will feel desire, we will feel passion, but they are not to drive us. They are there to reveal what's going on. The world says let passion and desire alone determine behavior and choices. The world says have fulfilled desire without ongoing commitments, but that's a hollow copy of what God intends because God only showed us passion tied to commitment. Jesus Christ, he showed us passion tied to commitment. It is the only way God has ever shown us passion, is that his love for us was immediately followed by his commitment to send his only son to die for us. Passion must be tied to commitment for it to really count. 
God intends for our desire and passion to increase and become sweeter and more powerful as the journey of trust and commitment deepens. Sex is the fulfillment in a relationship of passion and desire, and so it should be. But it will leave us feeling cheapened and empty if it's separate from God's intention of marriage. See, why? Why do, I, you know, why do, we, why do we say you'll feel cheap if you have sex outside of marriage? Because it doesn't express the value that you hold. Because passion is meant to be tied to commitment. And that with both of those, we will know true love and true passion. Number 14, how does God bring people together? How does God bring people together? You know, Jillian, I'm single and I'm ready to mingle. I'm searching. Well, don't go creeping. Don't go prowling. Don't be no creeper. Don't be no stalker. Derek Prince says that God is a matchmaker. Derek Prince believes that God brings the woman to the man. In my case, God brought the man to the woman and then the woman to the man. It kind of worked out both ways. But he suggests that the biblical principle is Eve was brought to Adam. Think about it. Esther was brought to the king. Rebecca was brought to Isaac. Ruth was brought to Boaz. And that was as far as I could think this afternoon. But I'm sure there's more examples. You know, just as a side note, I'm sure that's why guys like eating ribs, right? Adam and Eve. Eve was made from Adam's rib. You know, men, if you've always felt like there was a piece missing, yeah, God stole your rib. That's why you're like eating ribs now, because you're still missing your rib. <laughs> when Adam saw Eve, when Adam saw Eve, he's like, whoa, man. And then second thought, those are some tasty ribs. <laughs> okay. I was going to tell you a story here, but I'm going to have to cut to number 15. Number 15. How do I stay? This is the final one for the married people, and then I'm going to be passing the ball to John, and I don't know what he's going to do with it. But how do I stay attractive when Bay and I are married? How do I stay attractive? Okay, well, really quickly for the married people here tonight, I would say this, contentment and gratitude. Contentment and gratitude. Oh, she's not saying I have to go to the gym. Well, I might say that in a minute. Okay, but <laughs> to stay with me. Nothing is a bigger turnoff than discontent and ingratitude. You know, we have to like who we are with. We have to value the gift we've been given. That's contentment, valuing what we have. I, I had to laugh this morning because John's like, what matters to her matters to me. And he's like, I always give her what I want and I, what she wants. And he has, absolutely. But I also thought to myself, but I'm quite content. Like, I'm quite a contented person. So he's been quite fortunate that I don't want for much, just had to say. <laughs> you would be interested to know what goes through my head sometimes during those sermons. <laughs> but con contentment is saying the grass is green where it's watered. I like who I'm with. Commitment to our spouse is actually also very sexy. The world thinks it's not, but it is. Commitment, contentment, gratitude. The second thing is that we have to recognize in a marriage that our body is not our own. We need to be good stewards, good stewards of our physical health, our mental health, not only for ourselves, but also for our spouse. You know, attractiveness is totally about who you are as a whole person. It's the whole package. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? But in marriage, desire is not just tied to how you look. It's tied to who you are. It's pretty hard to be attracted to someone in a marriage who's critical. That'll kill desire. Pretty hard to be attracted to someone who's hard to please. Ow, my dinner's cold. It's pretty <laughs> I've got to finish. <laughs> oh dear. Where was I? <laughs> I've lost my place. It's pretty hard to be desirable if the person is just lazy. Yeah, that's going to kill attraction. That was the not picking up the socks and cleaning the whiskers out of the sink. I did hear that somebody else's husband cleans the whiskers out of their sink, and I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Okay, look. <laughs> You've established while you're dating that you are clearly each other's cup of tea. Mmm. 
So how do you lose your enjoyment of it? You lose your enjoyment of your cup of tea if it becomes cold. Nobody likes cold tea. Nobody. You throw it out. So attraction is keeping it hot. Stay hot. Don't get cold. Don't get critical. Don't get lazy. Don't get reluctant. Stay committed. Stay involved. All right, there you go. That's 15 questions asked and answered, everybody. You know, tonight I want you to know you can trust God that he has got the right one for you. When I met John, I was on a boyfriend holiday. I was quite happy. I wasn't looking for someone. And then he came along at the right time. I was at the right age, the right stage, and it was the right time. Our purposes were going in the same direction. But there are people here, and you're like, Jillian, it all worked out great for you, but it hasn't worked out great yet for me. So what I want us to do tonight is pray a prayer together. I've written out a prayer that I want to pray. And uh, you don't have to pray this, but I really believe that there's some people in here that God has freedom for you because you know what? The truth brings freedom. So I've written out a prayer that I think would be very powerful for you to pray tonight over your life. So would you, if you want, repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I thank you, God, that you want what's best for me. I pray tonight, God, that you would fulfill your purpose concerning me. Forgive me where I have strayed from your plan. Heal and restore me, body, soul, and spirit. I commit to living relationally pure. Holy Spirit, I ask your help to live holy and free. Free me from all bondages and empower me to live passionately, to live a life of love. I trust in your timing in my life. You are a good, good Father. Amen, amen.